Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Bonnie. Um, I've, I'm here to give a presentation on prioritization because this is a topic that um, I hold in great regard. I feel very strongly about this. I think this is a skill um, that a lot of us um, need to continuously learn and improve on. And that's why I'm here to share some of my knowledge and some of my learnings. Um, and again, this is just directional because a lot of the recommendations I make here may differ may differ from case to case, uh, but I'm here and happy to share whatever I know. Um, so let's get started. Um, before I dive deep into the topic, um, I just want to introduce myself, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, I was the ex-product um, manager lead for user engagement for Flipkart. For those who are not familiar with it, it's a $13 billion unicorn based out of India. Uh, I joined when we, were, when we had not yet gotten our first billion dollars, so I've seen that trajectory from it being a small, lean startup to being a massive, huge unicorn today. Uh, and even this year, they've received four and a half billion dollars of funding. Uh, so Flipkart continues to grow. Uh, I'm glad I was a part of that trajectory and growth. I was their first mobile product manager. Um, and by the end of it, I was leading their user engagement charter as a product manager. Um, as of today, I've worked in Silicon Valley for the last couple of years. I've worked with a lot of startups. Um, recently, I work with Shipped, uh, which is an on-demand grocery service. I manage their um, entire member experiences across um, mobile apps and web. Uh, specifically look at creating delightful experiences for users, um, retention and engagement. Um, I've had the opportunity to work, and this is mostly when I was back in India, across a variety of startups. So I worked with B2B, B2C, I've seen most of them fail, so I have that sort of learnings as well. Um, I worked across mobile apps, desktop, um, again, developing and developed markets. Um, and I'm an architect by education, so I'm very, very picky about my pixels. Um, so I have a lot of focus on product design um, and business. I've, I actually started my career as an investment banker. So I moved from investment banking to venture capital. So I know that side of uh, the ecosystem uh, on what it takes to be um, uh, sort of on, a line, on page with investors, what do investors look for from founders and product specialists, so on and so forth. Um, I have four um, topics that I want to cover during the course of this presentation, very briefly at that. Uh, the first is, why do I believe, um, and this is my core belief, why is prioritization a must-have skill in today's product management world? Um, is there, and if yes, is there a right or a better time to prioritize during your, or in your scheme of everyday to-do things to do as a product manager? Um, how do you prioritize? Um, so what are some of the popular frameworks that I have used or I continue to use? And this is sort of the crux of this presentation, I would say, which is there are so many challenges along the way. And anybody who's worked as a product manager um, would know that it's not always that rosy picture to say, oh, I know what I want to build, and it'll go out there, and we'll, we'll be able to build it. There are tons of roadblocks. And I'm going to try and talk about some of those and how we can circumvent some of those. Um, so why is this important, and why did I choose this topic? Even today, um, I'm very, very uh, sort of, um, I love the product management community here and back in India, and this is a common theme. I don't know how to pick the right thing. I don't know whether I should invest in an existing feature or build a new feature. I don't know whether I should pivot. What does pivoting mean? Uh, why is this more important than that? How do I funnel in uh, this stakeholder's request versus that? How do I prioritize? This is something that's a common theme. Even if you go online and check Google, you will see that there is so much content around this because there is demand for this content. So every day, this seems to be the biggest challenge that we face as a community. Um, and this is, again, across. This is an epidemic problem. This is across P2B uh, PMs, enterprise consumer PMs, platform PMs, startup PMs, unicorn PMs, established company PMs. Um, and so I just wanted to reiterate that this is something we must do uh, in order to make the right kind of impact at work. Um, and what I mean by right impact is 
you can either prioritize to make, like Ken Norton says, 10% impact or you can make a 10x impact. And if you're good at prioritization, you can do the latter or at least strive to do it. This is something that I chanced upon when I was reading something, um, and I think it articulates this core belief very well, which, which is that a lot of us as product managers, we focus on making our product successful. So we are constantly trying to look at dashboards and trying to measure product KPIs, which are how do we make the product successful. Um, but there is also something and a concept called product manager KPIs, which is how well are you enabling yourself to make the product successful? So what I mean by that is, of course, the first thing is, as a product manager, my KPI would be, how are my product KPIs doing, which is the product that I handle, which is the product that I manage. But there are also more layers of abstraction, which mean, how well am I building the vision? And does it take into account all my stakeholders? Um, am I keeping all my stakeholders aligned on that vision? Does everybody speak the same language? Um, and you would go back to that famous um, uh, diagram where product is supposed to be at the intersection of design and business and tech, right? But are we keeping all those stakeholders aligned on that common vision? And then this is sort of the summary of what this presentation is all about. Can you keep all those stakeholders working on the most important thing, which um, is prioritization, right? Um, so again, prioritization is not only key to the success of your product, but also for you as a product manager to go to the next level. If you can't do this well enough, you will never make that 10x impact. Um, this is again something that I have come to learn um, by success or by failure, I have seen that, and you'll uh, sort of agree with me on this, product managers are continuously context switching. High level, um, backlog. High level, backlog. Backlog, high level. We are doing this every day, every hour, where we have to keep our eye on the 30,000 feet view and the nitty gritties of the project you are executing, right? And in this context switching, um, and going back and forth, uh, we need to realize where we should prioritize first. So once you have a roadmap, don't forget to go back to it, to the high level themes, to keep and to continuously keep prioritizing the themes because your themes inside a roadmap will map to sort of what are called the big hairy audacious goals of the company. So keep going back to this, do not lose sight of your roadmap or your vision uh, in pursuit of the backlog. Uh, and so what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is when you funnel in everything and you make a roadmap and from the roadmap you make a backlog, don't forget to go back and keep prioritizing this to churn out the right list there. How to prioritize? Again, this is a more um, sort of educational thing. I don't want to dive too deep into it. There are more than 20 frameworks available for prioritization. Um, I use a couple. I have used a couple. Uh, and there's a lot of content on this. But the ones that I particularly find useful or I have used in the past, this is a new one. So this is called opportunity scoring. Um, and the premise of this framework is that every um, user on your service uses you to accomplish a job. Are you underserving them, over-serving them, or just about serving them right for that job? You can read up more about this, or I'm happy to answer questions post. Uh, but this is called the opportunity scoring, where you basically try to find um, areas in your roadmap or your backlog um, where you are either underserving somebody, and hence it should be prioritized, or you're over-serving them, and hence it should be deprioritized. Um, this is called opportunity scoring. There's another one which has been around for a long while. Uh, and we may not use it in this particular form, but I think we all use it in some way. Which is This is the uh, Kano model, which basically says, what do I absolutely need in, in the product for it to work, which is the must have? Um, what will I build and nobody will want it, which is the indifferent? 
uh, what seems really attractive, which is the blue line there, which means that every time you increase functionality in that feature or for that theme, you will get higher and higher satisfaction from the users. And then there's performance, which means that's something you need to keep maintaining and keep supporting. For example, your app shouldn't crash um, as you scale users. And so these are two sort of um, frameworks that help you prioritize those tricky ones. There are also a couple of other ones which you will, which you're probably using already, or you would have seen um, other PMs using. The one that I particularly like to use is the Ian, um, is Ian's framework. Basically what it says is, take your company goals, have product themes around those. For example, retention is a theme, virality is a theme, or user engagement is a theme. Have those themes, um, have your project ideas under those themes. Rate those project ideas by impact, by cost, whatever your prioritization criteria is. For example, burn, uh, for example, resources, whatever your prioritization criteria may be, and then order them in there. That is Ian's framework. Um, it's very popularly used. Buy a feature is again one where you have, you're trying to decide between two different approaches to solving the same problem, um, or two different concepts, uh, and you get your users to say, where will they put their money? So you have limited currency, and you say, between these five things, where will you put your currency? And you basically, so I, I have used this, for example, in user testing, where I say, if I am to improve search via this or via this, and these are my three ideas in search, uh, where are my users putting their currency to say, this is what I want? Um, Moscow is, again, must have, should have, could have, won't do. Uh, again, these are different names to sort of the same premise, uh, which is what is going to move the needle up the most, and what is what what are those features which nobody is really going to care about, or which is not going to move the needle. Again, uh, my idea of introducing this was not to say that you should pick one and commit to it. It is to say that there is a variety of tools out there. I keep moving between some of these. Um, for example, when I'm really trying to scratch my brain to get out um, innovative things or trying to think of things that or push myself to think of things where I'm, we are probably not serving our users and we can do better, I go for this. I'm trying to do this, for example, now um, at SHIP. Um, but the point, again, the point is that different tools, they're different frameworks. Do what's best for you and don't be afraid to oscillate between them. Uh, and try each of them depending on your project or your team or the stage of your startup. Um, I wanted to do this and tell me if it's a good idea. I wanted to actually um, do like a sample exercise with the group here just to get the energy up. Uh, and this is a live example. Um, and it put me in a really tough spot when I was in Flipkart. So I'm happy to share my journey of, of how I managed it. So uh, there was this... Um, big feature that we wanted to release. This is way back in 2015 um, or 14, I forget. But um, we wanted to do this really new idea which had failed miserably in the West. And so obviously India is leaps behind in terms of e-commerce trajectory from the West. And so we always look to the West for best practices or uh, ideas or inspiration. Uh, and all the competitive research that, I, and I, this was like my baby. Um, and I come up with this idea and I was very excited about it. Uh, but obviously to my dismay, I saw that it had failed miserably. Miserably in the West. Um, and it's a different story that we did end up building it. Uh, but the exercise I want to do with you is, there were two use cases of this feature. We could go down this route or we could go down the other route. Um, and it was not either or, it was which one should we do first, which one should we prioritize first. Um, and so um, the feature was basically a messaging interface inside an e-commerce app. Um, and the use cases were, should we allow Flipkart users to talk to each other via the messaging interface? So you and I are Flipkart users, can we talk to each other? Or should we allow Flipkart user to talk to the seller um, whose product I'm buying. Both are very, very um, different use cases. Both seem very powerful. 
and um, there was sort of a gridlock um, for the upper management to say, no, we want to do user to seller. And um, me and my team had a different viewpoint, which was to say we want to do user to user. Uh, and so I went, we went back to, we took a step back and said, how would we prioritize this if, this, if we were to, to be unbiased parties to this exercise? Um, the first thing I did was, what matters to the company right now? We were at that phase where Flipkart had gone from, when I joined them, we had less than 5 million users uh, across the mobile apps. By the time we were launching this feature, we, I think we were already at 20 million. So, which was pretty much most of the Indian population that transacted online. Um, so, what mattered to the company was not really acquisition, it was engagement. We wanted our 25 million users to come back to the app. So that was the one company goal that we wanted the feature to align to. The second was put the, uh, like I mentioned before, what is your prioritization criteria? What is your hurdle? What is, what is that thing that is going to block you? Um, for us, was it dollars? Um, no. For us, was it engineering bandwidth? No. Uh, for us, it was what kind of data are we going to get? If two Flipkart users talk to each other about deals, about categories that are trending, about uh, the kind of questions that I would ask my husband before I purchase something, that is very, very rich data for Flipkart to mine. Um, so I, I use some of those criteria to score those two versus each other, right? Um, another thing, Will this give us strategic advantage? Will this make us first to market? Uh, will this be a differentiator for us? Because we were at that stage where we needed to do things strategically. So it was, again, the company goal was not acquisition as much as it was engagement. Um, we had different criteria. Um, and so basically I scored all of those, those two against each other on that. The other thing was, um, scaling with this. Um, I haven't mentioned it here, but the other thing that stood out to me on the user to user versus user to seller was that user to seller will be restricted to the scale of the orders that we have on Flipkart, which is I place an order once a month, but, and that will, that will be my conversation with the seller. So I bought this TV from you. I want to know what is the warranty. Uh, and it'll be very product specific. But a user to user will scale, those conversations will be about shirts, about diapers, about categories, about sales, about, uh, hey, what is our budget for, um, I don't know, Amy's gift uh, for her birthday, or a lot of other things. So we looked at, we did the math to say, this is going to be X number of um, sort of, we are going to impact X number of conversations or X number of users, this is going to be 10 times of that. Um, so like I said, a lot of different prioritization criteria. The second thing, we worked with teams to make sure that they, we had their buy-in in these criteria. So for example, I ticked off that uh, uh, sort of tech cost was not a concern. It was because I had the implicit buy-in of the engineering manager, of the engineering director. So the other thing that I wanted to highlight uh, is Again, align to the company goal, have your prioritization criteria put in place, score your different ideas according to the criteria, and do that not in silos, but working with teams. Um, again, this is what I said. We did it because we wanted engagement, uh, not acquisition. We wanted a strategic advantage. Um, and we, were, we wanted to bet on in-house capabilities. So we wanted to build that infrastructure. We wanted to push our teams to build, to build that. So our criteria was different. Uh, and we went ahead with user to user because we were able to do this um, uh, prioritization. Okay, this is, um, uh, like I said, sort of the, this is the not the rosy picture of prioritization. This is actually putting it into action. Um, there are tons of challenges. Um, I've highlighted three which might be most common, which most of us would have faced. Um, first is resources. Um, I've faced this 
in a 20 member team at Flipkart and a 200 member team at Flipkart. Resources will always be limited, especially because of our roles. We are product managers, but um, who are we kidding? We manage our products. It's not like we have teams dedicated to us. We will never have designers, 20 designers, um, or 200 engineers completely allocated to our product. So we will always have a shared pool of resources, and they're always limited. Um, multiple stakeholders. Again, that's just a virtue of our job. We work with business, with marketing, with analytics, operations, with uh, other fellow product managers who are managing other parts of the product, say, inside the mobile app. Um, leadership team. And who not? Like, every, of course, and customers. So you have so many, so many stakeholders. Um, and they all have their voice. And you need to hear all of them. And the last is, and again, this is something I have faced, and I'm sure we have faced, absence of data. It's something that you really believe in. You know it's going to be a hit. Uh, it's something that's never been done before, right? But there's no data. How do you sell it? Um, you know, maybe because you can't user test, maybe because you don't have the budget for it, you don't have the tool for it, uh, you don't have time for it, um, you don't have data for it, so on and so forth. Um, and so then with these challenges, and there are a couple of more, how do you really execute on your um, priority list? How do you actually get the most important thing to be worked on? Um, and uh, according to my definition, Prioritization or the process of prioritization doesn't end at making that list. It is constantly making some uh, all your stakeholders working on that most important item, which is the number one on your priority prior, uh, priority list. Right? That to me is prioritization. Um, so how can you sort of overcome these? There is hope, um, like the slide title says: limited resources, cut back on your requirements. And what I mean by that is. Um, make the perfect MVP, which is your minimum viable product. So uh, even, for example, features that I've built at Flipkart or features that I'm building at Shipped or other startups, try to scale back on what is going to make the most impact out of your product idea. Right? There will be 20% of it which will make 80% of the impact. Try to carve out that 20% and leave the riffraff. That is um, called versioning, or making the MVP, or phasing it out, whatever you may like to call it. This is a very, very good uh, pushback to limited resources, where you cut down on what's going to make the most impact. Um, multiple stakeholders. What I have seen working in this um, particular challenge is align people. It is very much a part of your job to keep everybody on your team aligned internally and up and across. So up the ladder and across the verticals, right? It is very much our job. Um, and again, whenever you feel the need, fall back to your company goals. Um, another sort of recommendation here is um, try to get the bang for the buck. So. When you're trying to funnel so many different requests from so many different uh, stakeholders, like your customers and your leadership team or whoever, um, try to cut out the noise. And as you gain experience as a product manager, you will very easily be able to cut, off the no cut out the noise and try to keep the meaty stuff. Um, absence of data, what you can do about that, stick your neck out. Um, I've done this once, a uh, couple of times, but the ones that I really stuck my neck out, um, it worked out well and it didn't work out well. I'll tell you why it worked out well, because I gained tons of experience um, trying to do this whole process over and over and over again with different stakeholders and different parts of the um, um, value chain. Uh, and it taught me that if you really believe in something, you need to stick your neck out. Own it. So uh, there will be many, many times where you won't have data, you won't have time to A-B test, uh, you won't have tools for it, whatever the case may be. Own it, list out the risks, um, sort of have a plan for the risks, 
say, I know this is a known risk, this is the associated uh, risk, and this is how I'm going to tackle it if it happens. But sometimes listen to your gut and let your gut guide you. Um, again, always focus on making that 10x impact. Um, there will be some quick wins, quick wins down the way, and you must do those. Always keep your eye on the price, uh, which is how can I take this product from here to here. Um, uh, and so I just wanted to sort of, I threw in a lot of uh, points here and there. I just wanted to sort of lay it and wrap it up. Um, be an advocate for your stakeholders while you are prioritizing. Do not forget your stakeholders, but be very, very impact focused. Cut out the noise um, and ask the right questions. This is how you will build a good base for your priority list, things that you need to prioritize. Always, when you have a priority list, visualize it. Always keep it up to date and be very, very transparent about it. And remember, your job doesn't end at visualizing a priority list. It should be about you evangelizing that list. You need to go from door to door, get everybody together, and have everybody motivated and eager to work on that thing that you think is the most promising thing. Um, and I've seen that um, shift when you have your engineering team motivated and kicked about the, the feature versus not. There is a world of a difference in the speed at which they work or um, the thought that they put in in just testing it. Um, this makes a world of a difference if your team is on page. Um, so evangelize your priority list continuously. Um, and like I said, align them. Align everybody. Um, and drive your execution. Be accountable for execution of your priority list. Uh, think of that as a part of the prioritization process. And again, I've mentioned this point because I've seen a lot um, of this happening where we make a list and we stick to it. It's like our Bible. Uh, don't hold on to your roadmap or your backlog or your priority list. Go back and adjust it if your company goals change. Go back and adjust it if your prioritization criteria change. Go back and adjust it if now you have data versus before you didn't. Um, and do that continuously. And again, this is just a summary. Don't work in silos. Prioritization will not work that way. If you want people to work on that next big thing, you need to keep them aligned. Be open to how you failed in the past and what you can do better next. Um, this is both in terms of how you prioritized or which framework you used. Keep learning from the past uh, and definitely adapt to changing goals of the company. Your startup or your company will always be in a particular stage and that stage will warrant different company goals. So always align yourself to those goals. Thank you and open to any questions that you may have. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Sure. And thanks for the, the, the example. It was very interesting. Sure. Uh, and I was wondering if you had an example of a failed prioritization or a time, a time when, not necessarily in your own career, but a time when a bad prioritization happened and what kind of consequences it led to? Um. I think this happens every day. Um, my memory is failing me. I'm sure I've done a couple of those. But every time, and this is again my notion, every time something that you did did not move the needle, it is bad prioritization. It means you did not do your re user research, you did not find the right metrics, or you did not align to the right goal, or you didn't execute it right. It was poor prioritization. Um, Forgive me because I can't think of a specific example. Um, I forget what Evernote did, but they launched a specific feature, I think last year, which had terrible, terrible feedback. Uh, oh, yeah. Work chat. yeah, work chat or something I forget. It was poor prioritization because they picked the wrong thing and they prioritized it for business goals, not forgetting completely 
the customer advocacy part of prioritization. So they didn't have that criteria of how is this going to uh, be met with from our users, which are millions of users, right? So they dropped the ball in terms of that um, is my assumption. So I would think that is an example of poor prioritization. Sure. Sure. Right. Right. Sure. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Sure. Um, as a product manager, again, I think the onus is on us to be very in sync with what does our technology infrastructure enable us. For example, there may be a feature request for you to say, um, this is just a hypothetical example to say, why don't you say this? Why don't your email say this as a subject line? This is uh, something 50,000 of your users said. But if that does not go well with the branding of your company, uh, you're going to hear that, you're going to funnel it, but you're not going to execute on it till it matches with your branding message. So whether it's tech capabilities or just things that, and there are tons of these requests um, in fact, just to add to that, especially users will continuously give you uh, solutions. My take to that is, and um, this is something which the jobs to be done, I don't know if um, others are familiar with it. Basically what it says is the customer, so my hypothesis or my theory on that is don't listen to the solution that the customer is giving you, which is what they will do 99% of the time. They'll say, do this, do this, do this. Try to get to the heart of it. What are they trying to, they are trying to get you to change the subject line because maybe they, the subject line you're using makes them think it's spam. So it doesn't have to be the subject line they are asking you to change to, but when you get to the root of the problem, you can, you can work your way around to solve that problem for whichever stakeholder. It will always be a mix. It will always be a mix. And that's where I specifically wanted to call out the gut prioritization. There will be times, and that's why we have Facebooks of the world and Googles of the world or Slacks of the world. These are people and teams and ideas that have been you know, done and they've taken the world by storm. It is because there was gut and some fair bit of uh, quantitative data to back it. So I think it has to go hand in hand. There will be some times where data will just shout out to you to say, oh, we need to do this. And there will be times when you will not have that. Um, and so you will have a mix and a you know, pinch of your gut or your qualitative feedback. Mm -hmm. Or maybe high on expected revenue. Sure. And another one that had very well defined data, mm -hmm. but you know, that important for you to make what you have from the data that's a little bit less. Like what, what do you use as tiebreakers in your mind? So, or how do you convince, or even if you have a tiebreaker, how do you convince other teams that like, this feature that's pretty high up has tons of data to back it up, and this is my gut feature? And sure. So Interesting question. I think. My gut has to be strong for both of them. Um, even if there's tons of data, and I as a product manager have from learnings in the past or just best practice, practices that I know or something similar I've done in other companies, if I know that, you know, again, like users can ask and ask, and 5 million users can ask for something for Flipkart. That is very, very strong data. Still, if you think as a product manager, 
um, it is your job to, to be the wall in between to say, I have very strong data, but this is the way I should slice and dice it. Maybe all the, for example, all those 5 million users are users from a particular state. Uh, and so that means that the problem or the solution is specific to that state. It doesn't mean it has to be on all of Flipkart. So to answer your question, I don't know if I've done that well, but what I'm trying to say is, as a product manager, you need to have your heart and soul um, to able in a, in a particular project to even imagine to get everybody's alignment on it. You cannot be, oh, I have low confidence on this, but it has high data, and I have high confidence on this, but this has no, no. I think the, the competition would be, this doesn't have data, but this has data. I have more instincts that this will work, and I have less instincts that this will work, but I still think both will work. Um, did that answer your question? To some degree, yes. Of course, you will need to validate it. So there is that whole process of uh, you take an approach. You don't have data to back whether the approach is right or not, but then you validate it. There is post facto validation. Uh, and that's where you get your qualitative and quantitative feeder. You feed data into something that you think might work. Vis-a-vis, -vis, you have data on something that should work. Maybe you could say, if you are going to put yourself out with your desk, <sighs> that it's on now you and your team to validate it even earlier. Yes, yes, and do a better job of, of it. Hey. Uh, so you talked about prioritization and how it is extremely important to prioritize tasks that help serve underserved needs. How exactly do you guys, well, sort of the process that you guys perform to identify underserved needs? So, I'll actually, um, that was one framework that is available to you. So, that slide was to give you just exposure to so many types of frameworks that are available. That is one particular framework, not everybody uses it. Uh, and what that framework does, I can talk to you about the, uh, after the presentation about it. It's something, um, that's called ODI. Basically, it means that the framework maps satisfaction versus importance. Uh, and it says um, the more important something is, the more satisfaction it will drive. And if you're not serving that quadrant, it's basically underserved. Um, and like I, I think I mentioned it, I'm trying to do it uh, more and more because I find value in it to, to find those really hidden innovative things that we are not doing today. So it's just a framework. You can choose whichever framework works for you. Priority framework? Sorry? Which, sorry, which one were you talking about? The priority framework? The opportunity scoring framework. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Um, how do you usually visualize your prioritization? So um, usually there's a high-level roadmap where you will have things like um, strategic advantage or user engagement or virality or growth or whatever your themes may be or user acquisition or activation or whatever your themes may be and then beneath with below that whatever your visualization technique is you basically have this is what I want to do short term this is what I want to do medium term this is my long term goal and then when you double click on one of those ideas they will they can be a uh, uh, sort of a mini roadmap inside that to say this is the feature but this is my MVP, this is my V1, my V2, my V3, depending on the scope of the idea. So you will separate the roadmap from like, your like, daily sort of sprint with engineering uh, it, Actually that's very uh, dependent on the tool you use to visualize. Um, the ideal way uh, and I think there are tools out there that help you do that, is you have the high level, which is, this is what I want to do in quarter one, this is what I want to do in quarter two, which is like high level statements. Uh, I want to solve for user retention in quarter four. And then when you click on that, the tool will allow you to see actual project ideas, again, coordinated by, I want to do this first, I want to do the second, I want to do this third. And we double click on one particular idea, there are tools like um, Product Board. There are tools like some people use Jira. Some people use Clubhouse. There are tons of tools out there. Um, but essentially, you always start from the high level, and then you can double-click and double-click and double-click. Um, 
because when you actually get a feature executed, there are tons of details on what you want the functionality to be and so on and so forth. So, sure. Hey. Yes. Like you wanted to click all the way down to today for like a couple hours. Oh, oh. So, so, so we, uh, again, that depends on the company and the culture within the company. For you personally. So, yes, I do. Um, and this is not a step on any team's toes, but it's generally a good idea to know where your team is spending its time and resources. And it particularly goes back to the alignment. For example, if your QA team is testing a, a feature which doesn't need to go out for the next three weeks, they're spending time and effort and overtime on that just because they do not know that we need to roll X feature out right now because we are fighting some fire. This, it is for the purpose of alignment and so that there is no communication gap. So we, we use Slack constantly to make sure that everybody is focused on doing the right things. Great. Um, last uh, question, I think. I had a question on items that you might carve out outside of a prioritization mm -hmm. uh, matrix or somehow fit them in with like a carved out percentage of work to be done. So I would explain these as like customer clusters or things that are important to make the experience really good, but they may not be part of the MVP. But sure. if you don't do it, it's like, will the customer really think this is a great product? Sure. Do you carve those out as like, okay, 15% of the time we will sure. do those, or do you do it as actually integrating it as a satisfaction feature? Sure, I think that's a great question. So there are certain things where either those uh, ideas amount to just customer delight, or they just amount to better experience. For example, uh, making sure that your app is not buggy. Um, it's not a it's not a uh, uh, a metric that most of us have on our dashboards to say so many crashes happened today. It's not something, and and all of us will be guilty of that. But that is something that is an integral part of customer experience. So yes, to answer your question, um, we should always strive to have five percent, seven percent, ten percent of our engineering bandwidth working on those things. For example. Um, at Shipped, we've just recently, our QA team just recently um, made a couple of fixes for being accessible for people who are colorblind and people, um, exactly. Uh, and so we do uh, try to carve out time for these things. I mean, these are not our top business metrics, but we care about these things. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Um, there is no method to that madness. No. Um, to be fair, I think it's just being persistent. Um, there's no math that you can do to say, oh, I want 7% every one week, and because it's 7%, I want so many hours spent on this. It may not always work like that. It is that your team uh, believes that we need to spend time on this, and you have that ready for them to work on. So two things you can do as a product manager is to make your team believe that this is important enough for them to spend time on and for them to be willing to spend that 7% of their time on it. And second is to keep it available and in the right order so that when they have their bandwidth and they have a few hours to spend on it, they have everything ready for them to get going. Um, and that sort of sets them up for success uh, and that's something you can do as a product manager. Thank you for being such a great crowd. I hope this helped.